Something really weird is happening in Romania. But what's even weirder is how I found this out. One year ago, I published a video about a free Roman language, the Dacian language, spoken in what is today basically Romania. And I began to get some very strange comments under this video about tablets, mysterious Vatican letters locked away hiding the true history, Trojan columns, Eurasian steppe empires, and even weirder conspiracies around ruling the Roman Empire. Then the video spiked, it blew up, it got like 75,000 views in August. And I realized I had stumbled unknowingly into an entire social ecosystem of Romanian nationalist through Dacian conspiracy theories. What was this thing? And I began reading about this. These people call themselves decologists and the study of this field, decology. I'm Benjamin and this rabbit hole goes deep. Now, this video that spiked was about language, the extinct Dacian language, and the fact that I said it was extinct, which is true, made people, some of them, really angry. And I couldn't figure out why they actually believed this. So I dug into this and found this whole world of Dagopathy, these people that have fetishized Dacia and Romanian identity and culture as if it comes from this. Without any writing or evidence, they think Latin comes from Dacian and that there's hidden letters in the Vatican and a hidden history being concealed from them. It's bonkers. Dagopathy has shifted over different periods of Romanian history. Under classical liberalism it was born. It obtained eccentricities under constitutional monarchy. It grew a spiritual side under fascism. And under communism it became a national centralizing ideology. And then through social democracy it developed media tentacles. So before I can show you that Latin and the Romance languages do not come from Dacian. So this is two episodes. In this one, I'm going into Dacopathy, where it comes from, how it formed, how it mutated over time. And then once we have that, and we can build on it, then I can disprove these crazy, chauvinistic conspiracy theories. And just show you plainly that Latin does not come from Dacian. But before I can explain the language bit, you need to understand why people have this cultural mania, this insanity, in the first place. So in this video, I'm explaining Dacopathy. What is Phantasmagoria? Optical illusions produced chiefly by a magical lantern or imagined imagery. This Phantasmagoria was a word used by Titu Maiorescu, this fellow. In the 1880s, beards with a bow tie were very much stylish. But long before then, he had founded a literary society, Jumenea, the youth, in 1863. 
Now to the timeline, because you need to know what was happening in this time period as this idea grew to understand how it changed. So in 1848, there was a failed revolution in two of the three principalities of Romania. And in 1849, those two principalities, Wallachia and Moldavia, became an independent nation. That's important because this was happening right at the moment of romantic nationalism. Over the next two decades, Romania becomes a monarchy with a German king. Then in 1907, there are peasant revolts that just shake and split the country. Going all the way to 1919, through this period, there are these revolts and there are wars, the First World War, and Romania invades Transylvania and expands territory. From 1919 to 1940, it's Greater Romania, Romania More. And in this period, you get upheavals, you get fascists, trying to destabilize the government and throw it over. You actually get fascists in World War II taking over of different factions. And then after this catastrophe, from 1947 to 1989, you have communist dictatorship, essentially. No rights. So this idea of dagopathy that I'm getting to changed throughout each of these regimes. So during this time in the 1860s with this newly independent state, people were trying to assess what would be the groundwork, the bedrock of the Romanian culture. And aristocrats, boyars, had gathered in Yashi to determine what it would be under the heavy influence of German nationalism, by the way. And this is when something unpredictable happened. Back in the 16th century, it was reaching the end of the period in which Romanian princes, or this word, rebelled against Ottoman Turks and sultans rising up in revolt and fighting battles and wars with them. But one of the last rulers to do so was Johan. I find it interesting that Wales and Romania both have this name. But Chel Complete, the Terrible, he was in the north around Yashi, that's important for later, and he rose up in revolt against the Ottoman Empire. What this prince did is he went around bullying, killing some of the boyars, the boyars, the aristocracy, bullying them, in some cases killing them, to make them loyal to him. The fact that Johan the Terrible killed boyars had long-lasting repercussions, because 300 years later, descendants of these very boyars in this Jumanea society were sitting around a table in Yashi, trying to decide and lay down the cultural foundations of this new Romanian state. When a man walks in, named Bogdan Petrucecu Hajdel, and he says, no, he was not Johan the Terrible, Johan the Brave, this word. And Hajdao publishes a monograph, basically a fancier old-fashioned way of saying a reference book, on this vivod, this ruler, Yon the Terrible. They don't like this. He's praising the man who killed their ancestors, calling him a great patriot. And a rip opens up between them, within this society. This conflict between him and the Jumanea society causes him to seek out allies. He's siding with the then liberals of the time, 
the Jumonais society siding with the then conservatives. But he finds his two friends to help him piece together where Romanians come from. The first, Alexandru Xenopol. He's much more of a Romanist, but he's open to Daco Romanism, that the culture's fused with a bit of good feeling toward the Dacians, which is not felt by the Jumonea society so much, though they do romanticize the kings. Meanwhile, the Jumonea, under Titu, with poets like Cesar Boyac, an anti Semite, and national poet Mihai Eminescu, say proudly, we are Romans. And this is when Hajdel begins his Etymologicum Magnum Romaniae, though he only gets to letter B because of his insane entries. It would have taken him like 90 years to complete it. I mean, they finally just revoked his post because he kept entering in random folk tales with little basis in reality to boast up a prehistoric Romanian people. He even creates this entry in this encyclopedia about Basarab, the founder of Vlachia, the first independent Romanian principality, essentially, and says that he traces his lineage back to the kings of Dacia, which is complete and utter fantasy. But Hajdel gets weirder. Later on, there would be an historian and archaeologist named Vasile Pervan, and he was quite good at going around digging up Dacian sites, but being moderate and non-romanticized about it. I mean, he was a bit tilted toward them, but he wasn't crazy. And in this period, there were some tablets. They're called the Sinea Tablets, found in 1875 at a Neo-Renaissance castle, Pelesh Castle, being built for the king. And there was a gold treasure composed of several tablets found with lead tablets, written in an unknown language and said to be the chronicle of the Dacians. These lead tablets were almost identical to lead tablets found at a local factory a few miles away. And the symbols were highly similar to those used in other Victorian age fantasies across Eastern Europe. Vasily Porovan says that Hajda forged these. And he did forge other documents trying to twist history into this narrow prison of ideas. Now, why would he do this and why do this then? Because Around the same time, he was in this Romanian society, the Romanian Academy, in the social circle there in the 1870s. It's a cultural form to promote Romanian culture. And he would have been around a man named Nicolae Densicianu, whose ideas are even weirder than Hajdau. And these two coming together against the Jumonea society is when Titu Maiorescu uses that word, Phantasmagoria, to explain their, well, silly ideas. Phantasmagoria. Now before I go further, I need to explain a few terms. The author Dan Alex calls this dacopathy, this aggrandizing Dacia over the historical realities of Romanian history. Academics also call this dacomania and thraco or tracomania for thrace, but also protocrinismo, protocrinismo, meaning the before time, as this has often been called that. I'm with Dan Alex in this, I'm calling it dacopathy here. In 1913, this rabbit hole gets a lot deeper. Shortly after Nicola Densicianu's death, 
book is published of his called Dacia Prehistorica. And what's in this book is crazy. Dan Alex calls this book Mystical Delirium. Mystical Delirium. Oh, that's nice. What's inside of it? This book is Stargate level crazy. Where they find a space portal in the desert linked to the other side of the universe. Which explains the dawning of human technology and civilization. But unlike Stargate, which is a film, it's harmless. These people believe that what's in this book, Dacia Prehistorica, is real. And they're unable to differentiate between fiction and reality. This book is essentially a 1200 page rant about the glories of Romania from a prehistoric viewpoint of a Pulaskian empire that covered most of Europe and Eurasia. And get this, governed by Uranus and Saturn, yes. Like I said, fantasy, fiction, Stargate stuff. <laughs> forth a theory that Latin, as in the Romans, was a dialect of Dacian, and that Dacians had migrated to Italy at some point in the past. When? Who knows? And laid the foundations of Rome. Do you remember that archaeologist, Parvon, I mentioned? This is what he had to say about it. Nikolai Densishanu wrote his fantastic novel, Dacia Prehistorica, full of mythology and absurd philology, which at its appearance aroused an admiration and boundless enthusiasm among lay Romans, that's common Romans, for archaeology. But where did this word Pulaskian come from? Palaskios is ancient Greek, and there are a couple writers who vaguely mention it to suggest that there were people before the Greeks, scattered around the Aegean Sea mainly, but a bit into the mainland. And this is probably a faint pre-Indo-European echo. But Densin Shanu claims that this was a Pulaskian Empire founded in 6000 BCE. 8000 years ago. Do you see what's going on here? He's saying Dacians or Romanians who still speak the same language with also having the inheritance of ancient Greece spawning them practically and Rome and the Roman Empire having right to all of their cultural produce as being theirs rather than the Latins whilst also conquering the Eurasian steppe this is chauvinism in every sense of the word and when was this empire? 8,000 years ago Really? But the key is when this book, popular at the time, came out, this was just on the cusp of the First World War. And needing to be secure in their new nationhood, still. With wars on all sides of them raging, many common Romanians latched onto this because it provided easy solutions to complex answers. That's always a dangerous thing. With peasant revolts and a world war erupting around them, it became an easy way to find a great nationalism to sturdy their emotions. And far right, Eastern Orthodox, a type of Christianity, nationalists, saw this, took it in and said, 
we can use this for our own means because we can say that we're defending an ancient glorious nation trying to restore it. We can use this as a tool of political propaganda. And they even began seeing figures which could give them a predecessor to Jesus. This wouldn't really go well for Romania's Jewish community. From 1919 to 1946, Romania changed its leader 29 times, including this guy. With this party. With this flag. Who were in power before the Nazis even started the war, including this ultra-religious guy. Some conservatives, some liberals, and military generals, including Ion Antonescu, who's important and who we'll get back to. Despite all of these upheavals, Romania between the wars was quite big. It was bigger than the present day. And with an ethno-nationalism sweeping Europe, they got caught up in this, and Dacia was an answer. And at this time, a man named Merci Aliada comes onto the scene with the Iron Guard. The Iron Guard, basically a fascist group trying to semi-legally overthrow democracy with the occasional illegal action, violent against the democratic government to establish a Christian state. Now, I'm not knocking Christians at all, but there's a type, especially in this period, that latch on to fascism. Think Franco in Spain, that version. And in this hybrid of religious fascism fervor, the Iron Guard launches an uprising under the Legion in 1941. And they kill 125 Jews by imitating kosher dietary laws with meat, putting them on meat hooks and slicing them in certain ways. That's horrific. Mercea even meets Nazi philosopher Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt was not a nice guy. Nazis were deeply mystical in their ideas. And so is this decopathy. I'm not saying they're linked. They just share a common trait about ancient mystical origins. But the point is, with this orthodox fascism going on, Mercea Aliada was preoccupied with the pre-Roman cult of a Thracian deity called Zamoxis. Now, he took for this a monotheism, supposed monotheism, which didn't actually exist. And then he attached this on to being a predecessor of Jesus. If Jesus went down for three days, Zalmoxis will go down for three years under the earth and come back up. Zalmoxis is reinvented by Mercea. He creates rites, initiation ceremonies that pre this, there's no true evidence they existed. And why? Because he's giving this fascistic philosophy a spiritual side so that the Iron Guard and these type people can say, we're defending the roots of an ancient faith with a glorious tradition. 
He even expands upon a myth about a sphinx-like rock formation in the Buchej Mountains, saying that this is the holy mountain, Kogayonon, and that Zamoxis went into the caves underneath this. And he creates like a mythical cult around these tunnels, these caves. He's taking a few words written by the historian Herodotus, blowing them all out of proportion to inject spirituality into fascistic sensibilities. And he's using the fantasy of Dacopathy to provide this spiritual narrative so that Romanian Orthodox fascism can claim defense of an ancient spiritual tradition. A tradition which never existed, of course. But getting back to Ion Antonescu, this military general who rules Romania toward the end of the Second World War. Mircea Eliade likes this guy, and so does a young man, Iosif Constantin Dragan, who goes to Italy to found an export company, helping the Mussolini regime, the fascists. As the communists are taking over Romania, he's not allowed back in and he's smart enough not to go back in. He stays in Italy and begins setting up a network of Daco, Dacomania people. It spreads from Italy to New York. He's building a network outside of Romania to push this ideology. Between 1947 and 1989, between one and two million Romanians were murdered by the communist regime. And the first of these tyrants was named Petru Groza. And he had this to say about the ancient Dacian king, Decebal. My last king was Decebalus, after whose death I became a Republican. So the communist regime is not throwing out Dacopathy. It's changing it to suit its ideological and insane class war oppressor, oppressed dynamic in order to control people. And the communists go back to Hajdal fighting against the boyar aristocracy as proof of their being right in this, that this Dacian glorious age is about being anti-imperialist and anti-West and eventually anti-Soviet. And it's interesting that communists are essentially usually atheists, but they don't throw out this cult of Zalmoxis. They use it to infuse a spiritual cult of propaganda around their leaders. And in 1961, something strange happens. Three tablets are found at a Neolithic site of the Vangcha culture. Basically 7,000 years ago. Tartaria tablets. The workers at this site bake these tablets in order to protect them, meaning that after they do this, we cannot properly carbon date them. Handy, huh? And these are largely likely a forgery, also considering that the symbols used were popular in Romanian literature at the time, echoing Sumeria present-day Iraq. And besides, this was under a communist regime, and we cannot take seriously for truth. Anything a communist government says, can we? No. 
When Russia, or at that time the Soviet Union, succeeded to expand its insidious communist ideology over Eastern Europe, Romania managed to succeed in keeping a bit of arm's length, a bit of independence from Moscow, and they wanted to expand this further. So they dug into this Dacian identity, creating a national fervor of a glorious past that was neither Slavic, like Poland, Ukraine, Czech, Russia, and neither Romanized like the imperialist West. This era is the beginning of what is called national communism. And they turned inward and used this romanticized Dacia in a new kind of Romanian communism to murder their own people with dacopathy. <laughs> In 1971, Ceausescu gives a speech, a grand speech called the July Thesis. And this is important because he echoes a centralized, inward looking state, cult of personality. Murals of Dacian nationalism begin appearing to remind people of their glorious past. And in 1974, Edgar Papu coined the term proto-chronismo for Dacianism, which means the before time, and the dictator Ceausescu, in the same time, changes his post from president of the state council to complete executive control as president of the Socialist Republic of Romania. Which was not a republic, of course. And whatever Ceausescu said was law, and he began building on this idea of a pre-Roman Dacian state, changing its history to shape it as being highly centralized and controlled by a strong figure revolting against imperialism and decolonization to control his people and his grip. In 1980, an epic film is created called a Burabista about the Dacian king, Burabista. They use this Sphinx rock formation. This Dacian mythology is shaping how the regime makes people see their own country. And I must quote Vladimir Tismineanu in this. He says, regarding the, the power with these dacopathic ideas, protochronism was the party-sponsored ideology that claimed Romanian precedence in scientific and cultural discoveries. It was actually the underpinning of Ceausescu's nationalist tyranny. During the communist era, Joseph Konstantin Dragan had gone to Italy and built a network promoting his dacopathic beliefs. And he was now worth over $800 million. Through the Dragan European Foundation, he's able to seed this further into Romania, claiming Dacia had spawned all of European culture. And now with the communists gone, he began investing directly into Romania, pushing these ideas using media outlets. Two publishing houses, a private university, a weekly newspaper, a television station, a radio station, a daily newspaper. And then he pays to build this, this, Kipu Rajalui Dak Decibal the face of the Dacian King Decibal, a 55 meters high sculpture above the river Danube. It took 10 years to dynamite this thing out and carve then by hand 12 sculptors. 
Now, I'm not doubting how glorious this thing looks. It's awesome. But it's also crazy. Crazy. Ooh. But the craziest part is not that he built this ecosystem to promote his beliefs and push it into society. It's that he had a protege to carry on this work after him. Napoleon. No, not that Napoleon. Savasco. Together, Savasco and Dragon built this magazine to promote these dacopathic ideas. Noi, Daci, we Dacians. And they organized a yearly International Congress of Dacology. These people think there was an invasion of India from Carpathia, the mountain ridge, in the middle of Romania, and that the Dacians, in conquering India, formed the Indo-European languages, which then spread throughout. So they're going before Latin now in this. It's bonkers. And don't get me started on these time tunnels underneath the Sphinx and Egypt mirroring them to create the Sphinx in Egypt. It's crazy. 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 Ooh. That's Dacopathy. If you enjoy this content, please consider helping by way of Patreon. Thanks. But it gets crazier. There is a language isolate in Japan called Ainu. And Savasku sees this as proof that the Dacian Empire, which expanded over the Eurasian steppe, took Japan as well. And that then the Japanese came in and pushed them out, even though there's no relation between Ainu and any Indo-European language. They think Dacians produced the world's first writing, the plow, the wheel, the cart. I mean, it goes on and on, a pile of... You know what? I don't need to explain this any further. You get what dacopathy is. It's pure chauvinism. So in the next video, I can explain why and how Latin does not come from Dacian without having to go through any of this nonsense. Thank you for watching.